Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Edil Anand. I live in Yorkshire. Today we are doing a program on our British Indian Tamil radio about a important issue which affects most of us. Like me, many of you might have been born and brought up in India or in uh, abroad and moved over to Britain for numerous reasons and have made UK our home. We all made a conscious decision to settle down in UK and become part of our new home. Although technology and relative ease of travel has made the world smaller, COVID pandemic has taught us many lessons and brought open many issues. We still have roots back in our home country, and especially we miss our elderly parents and dependents. We have heard about many elderly people in the nursing homes in UK during the COVID pandemic and around Christmas time who could not see their relatives and some of them unfortunately died without their relatives by their bedside. Some of us also were really unfortunate to experience similar issues with our family in India during the later stages of our life. Culturally, we grew up as being part of the wider extended family and the obligation to look after the elderly people, especially towards the later stage of their life. Coming to the current issue, ADR or the Adult Dependent Relative Rules were changed in 2012 as the government was committed to a fairer immigration system to prevent burden on the taxpayer, promote integration, ensure family migration on a sustainable basis, uh, which is fair to migrants and also to the wider community by not being reliant on access to public services funded by the UK taxpayer. This requires a long-term personal care needs which were unmet in their home country. To address this, many individuals and organizations are requesting to change the rules. Uh, many doctors and health professional organizations have taken the initial step to take it forward through petitions and campaign. As you might be aware, there are more than 150,000 non-British workers in the NHS, which might contribute up to 13% of the workforce and about 39% of the hospital doctors and 20% of GPs qualified outside the UK. And without these help from these professionals, our NHS system might collapse. Today, we will speak to people who are involved in this campaign. And our British Indian Tamil Radio RJ, Dr. Kavita Sudhakar, will start the discussion. Uh, over to you, Kavita. So thank you, Dr. Anand, and welcome to British Indian Tamil Radio. First of all, on behalf of our entire BITR team and our listeners, I welcome you all on today's program on ADR. So first of all, what is ADR? Were you born outside the UK and currently living and working in UK? Do you miss your parents? Does your children miss their grandparents' love and affection? Then this program is for you and continue listening to this British Indian Tamil radio and this is going to change in your life. We have an expert panel of members who's going to discuss and answering questions about ADR, visa rules and regulations, and how changing these regulations will help you and your family. First of all, it gives me great pleasure in introducing our first guest speaker of the day. She is a barrister, most inspiring woman, one of Europe's trial-blasting human rights lawyers, her long lists of accolades includes winning the first ever dowry case in the country, advising the Home Office on making the forced marriage illegal. She's very well known for helping as many people as possible in the courtroom. She fought for the rights of women. She stood firmly against the House of Law in discrimination against migrant women. She's a current member for CARE, and she's also one of the specialists in the advisory committee for the new domestic violence law. She is none other than Mrs. Usha Sood. Welcome to the program, Usha Ji. Vanakam, Kavita. Okay, Nandri, Nandri, Nandri. And um, first of all, I'm going to start, uh, Usha Ji. Could you explain what is the term ADR? As already said, it's the, the term stands for Adult Dependent Relative. And the rules that uh, were referred to were introduced in 2012 to replace some rather more flexible rules that were meant for elderly and uh, other dependents. 
In the main, ADR refers really to our elderly relatives. And uh, already it, it's been outlined that the 2012 rules make it almost impossible to apply from outside the UK to bring them here. Mm -hmm. uh, Usha ji, there are recent misconceptions around the ADR. Is it only applicable to the doctors? Not at all. In fact, um, a, a large number of my clientele are uh, people like teachers, nurses, accountants, um, IT workers, and they all qualify uh, for the right to bring their parents here. But it's a right in name only because the, the, the requirements are so stringent. Okay, okay. Shaji, I was just reading an article recently in one of the BMAs, uh, British Medical Association article, and I was so shocking and saddening to read about that. It shows the Home Office review showed approximately 2,325 applications had been granted between mm -hmm. 2010 to 2011. But in the recent years, the numbers had been uh, dramatically dropped. What is the reason behind this drop in numbers, Ushaji? Yes. So the numbers have dropped to around 100. And even of those 100, only a handful are actually granted outright. Mm. So you are really talking about a figure that is monumentally decreased. And uh, the reason behind that is, uh, it is along with the rules that were supposedly, uh, as, it, as in the introduction said, to uh, ensure fairness for the uh, services in the country, um, the, the requirements that the Home Office expects you to fulfill have been even more amplified or more heightened so that when you apply, um, they want you to show that your parents can't even tie their shoelaces, that sort of thing. So the, it's, it's even more stringent than appears on paper. And therefore, uh, many of those, even of the hundred or so, uh, might only succeed on appeal. So really it's been made, uh, the door is completely shut on elderly applications from abroad. And within the pandemic, this has become highlighted because a lot of people have to make multiple trips over when their parents are in trouble. Okay. So Ushaji, how are you involved in this one? And what are your principal leading arguments on this issue? Yes, so my involvement on the ADR side is where I have a choice, I try and ensure that people use an alternative route. There are some alternative routes and they don't give you indefinite leave, but they give you a right to have your parents here. So I use those routes. They also require a lot of evidence, but it's sustainable. And, and very often you can bring your parents here and then do it. So um, those alternative rules are there. But the, in addition to that, when I do have to use the ADR, I try and do absolutely everything to ensure that the Home Office really have to grant it. But Kavita, remember one thing. When you look at parents who are so frail that they really can't even look after themselves, very often you can't even put them on a plane. So what is the point in granting a right that is just so unachievable? You know, at the end, what they're saying is abandon them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very sad, isn't it? Hmm. Okay. Ushaji, one of the important aspects of this program is to create awareness about this issue. What do you think people should do? I think it's very, very important that people uh, reach out to their representatives in Parliament. I think if they have an, uh, a way of actually raising awareness amongst themselves as well, because like you said earlier, there are many misconceptions. So, you know, if there, there are people around who don't know what the requirements are and what that, the fact that there are alternatives, they should pass that message around. And they should certainly be petitioning Parliament uh, in addition to asking their representatives to talk about it to the, um, you know, to, to the Home Office. Um, it's a very hard um, journey we are on. And let me just say it outright. I don't think that the current government is very sympathetic to immigration change. Um, you know, in a sense, we've just heard the Home Secretary say that she doesn't think that the Black Lives Mat uh, Matter movement is right. Well, where is it? I don't know. The premise of these rules is that our old, older generation don't matter. You know, and that is really wrong. And if uh, you 
take the issue about being a burden on the state, how many of them would actually end up in an old people's home in this country? Practically none. So the, the way that it has been analyzed in the first place and um, the importance it has to the lives of the people who are working here, I think has been underestimated. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Good. And finally, is there anything else would you like to share it with our listeners, Usharji, today? I, I simply can't emphasize the importance of actually changing the rules. On a daily basis, I'm facing um, looking at elderly people who put their hands together and beg me to let them stay with their children and gran grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, despite having been a lawyer for so long, I, I don't think I've lost that sense of, um, you know, compassion for, for them. And I think we should all, you know, understand that even if we don't have parents anymore, the, the importance, the inherent right to look after your elderly in the twilight years should be that for everyone. Many of the people involved here are British citizens, but even if they weren't, you know, they are entitled to look after their parents. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Ushaji, thank you so much. We learned a lot of meaningful and significant information on this ADR issue today from you. I'm sure it will be useful for everybody. Thank you so much again for your valuable time. And uh, you are listening to British Indian Tamil Radio. We are going to resume our discussion again after listening to this super hit song, which is going to be Ushaji's favorite song as well. Let's listen to this song and then we'll come back to the British Indian Tamil Radio again. So welcome back to British Indian Tamil Radio. You are with RJ Kavita Sudhakar here. We are continuing our discussion on ADR visa rules and regulations. Next, I would like to introduce and invite our esteemed guest, Dr. Lakshman, consultant pediatrics, pediatrician from Suffolk Hospital. Welcome to the program, Dr. Lakshman. Thank you very much, Kavita. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Lakshman, could you let us know what exactly is the problem about this ADR issue? Thank you, Kavita. Uh, my parents, uh, my dad is 88. He has got advanced kidney failure. My mom is almost 80. She's very frail. They were living alone in Bombay, in Mumbai, in a flat, in a two-bedroom flat. For the last 10 years, I've been trying to support them, you know, frequent visits, uh, remote support, WhatsApp. But a time comes when it is not possible for them to manage. They don't feel safe and secure. They are two old people living in a, in a city. They don't feel safe. They can't go to any appointments, medical appointments. There's nobody to take them. They can't go by themselves. My dad can't hear. If there's an emergency, there isn't a way to respond. You know, two years back, my dad became unconscious with sepsis. My mom called me here. Yeah, my mom fell down. My dad called me. You know, it is not possible. Now, we knew, you know, they, they, they don't want to come here. They just want to be safe they want to be looked after they are not interested in any being in any particular place they just want to be looked after like any old people and i think that is what we also want to do but we knew that the adr visa was very tough in fact a, a, a couple of a friend of ours uh, they similar situation they are they paid 3500 pounds for each parent uh, and they applied and there was no response, just rejection, you know, just rejection. So this is not, you know, this is not right. You know, this is, a, this is not right. It has to change. This is a problem. This is about a small number of parents who don't have any other go in their home country. There isn't another child. There isn't another family. They are living on their own. And they've reached a point where they cannot live independently. And we know the carers and all these other structures can only work with supervision. You know, if, if from a remotely to manage these things is almost impossible. So, th so that is the problem, uh, Kavita. And I think anybody who is who has parents in whichever country of whichever culture can understand that this is not right. Yes, absolutely. I agree with the Dr. Lakshman. I think anybody can in this situation can relate with what you just said. Next to that, what exactly would you like to happen? Well, I'd like to, as Ushaji said, a more humane response to this, you know, rather than 
putting the barrier so that nobody can actually you know in practical terms nobody can overcome it you know we want a humane application of the of the rules of course we are not saying there can be no rules there have to be rules uh, but where a young when a family is when when the parent or parents are very old they are clearly not coping uh, there are young there are families here who are willing to look after them which is not always the case but they are willing to look after them and can look after them then i do not think and and you know, we are not asking as the usha ji said we are not going to bring them here and put them in a old age home you know we are not going to recourse to public funds for that we are going to keep them with us because that's why we are bringing them here then then it shouldn't be so difficult because that i think that that, that is what we are expecting that is the uh, uh, that is what we we hope will happen the change yeah. and what was the situation before the rules changed in 2012 uh, i mean as usha ji said i think the rules were applied i mean they were not still brilliant but they were applied a bit more humanely uh, you know we we could get 2 or 3000 people across so you know there is some this thing um uh, so yeah i mean i don't know the exact nature of those rules but i i know that uh, people were feeling more comfortable applying knowing that uh, there you know it's not just a loss of time energy effort and money mm-hmm. how are the rules currently applied uh, dr lakshmi Uh, again as uh, you said and as usha ji said you know the the people don't you know if you're going to up- spend 7000 pounds and get nothing uh, you know soon nobody is going to apply so very few people have uh, apply and if they apply it gets rejected i don't know the exact numbers but i think as usha ji said it's a handful of people who are who are able to come it sounds very depressing isn't it i think so yes how many additional people will migrate to uk if there is the relaxation of rules happen well i think the it's a, it's a perspective i think the first thing is this is about values you know this is not about numbers this is about values you know this is doing the right thing you know sometimes there's a disaster you know we don't worry about what it costs you know somebody stuck on top of a mountain you know you send uh, helicopters you don't worry about the cost so it's one of those things it's about values now i think about 600000 people are migrating to the uk every year i think that is my uh, approximate number so this is going to be a couple of thousand two three thousand people out of that huge number so you know people need to understand that you know in perspective this is a very small number of very needy people you know and there is a huge amount of misery being caused by this rule to those old people and to their uh, son or daughter who is here Uh, and the huge amount of distress which is being caused uh, and the numbers are not going to be uh, you know it's not going to be compared to the total number of people coming it's going to be really very small yeah yeah so what can be done to mitigate the financial implications if there is a relaxation of rules happen so i think the first thing is to emphasize the small numbers the second thing is to say that uh, you know it's not going to be you know the, 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 there isn't going to be increased uh it is a fallacy that there's going to be a huge cost to the exchequer because that is not true uh, these people will be looked after by people in their homes they are often like now my dad he's at the you know he's at the end of his life you know i am not going to want him to have a tech, you know technological uh, huge treatments you know we just want we want to give them love and care in our homes you know that which is not expensive it is not expensive uh, that is what we want to give you know if they want to put a, a health surcharge or something like that i you know i don't I, you know i don't think any of us objects to something like that but in truth you know this is sometimes the cost is not important in this case it's about values it's not about pounds it's not about numbers it's about what is the right thing to do and as i said uh, you know if it's a disaster this is a this is a disaster this upon all these families it is like a disaster you know we don't at that time you don't try to work out you know calculations mm. uh, you say well what is the right thing what is a british thing to do you know what what are our values i think that's what's important absolutely absolutely i agree with that yeah and thank you again dr lakshman we appreciate you taking your time to explain the deeper understanding of this issue about the adr and thank you again coming to the program today thank you dr sudhakar and dr anand for your kind time and for giving us this opportunity to talk to your listeners thank you very much thank you thank you so welcome back to british indian tamil radio stay tuned with uh, with us we are continue to discuss we are continuing our discussion on this adr issue 
Next, it gives me an immense, uh, immense pleasure to welcome our next guest, Dr. Mohammad Eid, consultant anesthetist, James Cook University Hospitals in Middlesbrough. Welcome to the program, Dr. Eid. Welcome, Tavita. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, we, are, we are happy to have you here, Dr. Eid. Could you tell us about yourself, please? Um, so, um, I'm a consultant, as I said, uh, working in Middlesbrough. I'm originally from Egypt, and that's where I was born, and I've lived there until I um, finished my medical school and then moved over to the UK in 2008. And I've been working as a doctor since then, and I've been a consultant for the last uh, four years. I'm also married to a doctor, and I have a two-year-old uh, daughter okay. and living here, yeah. Okay, that's nice to hear. Uh, Dr. Eid, I understand you would like to share your personal experiences with us. Could you share with us? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think the situation is that I've got two elderly parents who live in Egypt. Uh, both my mom and dad are above 70. And when I left them in, in Egypt um, in 2008, they were quite fit and well. They were living life to full. Uh, my father has always been the backbone of the house. So my mom always relies on him and everything. So she doesn't drive really. He's the one who takes her around shopping. He's the one who holds the finances, everything. So she totally relies on him. And, and there has been absolutely no issues at all until 2017 when I was towards the end of my training. Um, and when I was having a phone discussion with my dad and he told me about some symptoms. And I straight away realized what these symptoms were. And, I, and at the time he was well, I said, go and get yourself checked. And I'm going to come to Egypt straight away. Um, so I booked the flight, went back home. And I was lucky because, as I said, I was finishing the, uh, my training. I wasn't bound to a certain contract. I was about to apply for a consultant post, but I had to put that on hold to go and investigate what was going on. So I went back home and turned out, unfortunately, that my worries were true. And he had bladder cancer. Um, so I had to stay with them over there and help him with his treatment, chemotherapy and surgery and all that. And I'm the only son, nobody else to do this. Um, and unfortunately, the healthcare system in Egypt is designed to be a burden rather than help. So it's the patient who needs to go and organize appointments. They need to go and organize scans, investigations and all that sort of stuff. So that is always done by the patient or relative, which is a son or a daughter. Yes. And he got better, and then I returned to the UK. I got married, and I got my consultant post, and I started to investigate avenues of getting them to the UK because I knew now they're older, they're going to get more frail, we're going to have more problems, and they need to have somebody to look after them. Um, and I, I was basically told, don't think about it under the current rules. They're going to get refused. The situation is not compelling. And... Even if you apply and they get refused, they will never be granted a visit visa because they've already declared an intention to reside in the country by applying for an ADR visa. So that was quite disheartening. And, and unfortunately, things got worse over last year with the pandemic. I personally was classified as a clinically extremely vulnerable person. So I was asked to shield. I, I, I was advised against traveling or putting myself in a plane. And unfortunately, my dad became further and further unwell. He required emergency treatment because his cancer has come back. Mm -hmm. Now, even my uncle, who I used to rely on to help him, who lives, by the way, quite far away, himself was unwell. So my poor dad was unable to get treatment. My mom, who can't get around anywhere, was struggling. And she's saying she was unable to cope. And I had to make that decision between putting myself at risk by putting myself on a plane or leaving him and unfortunately I couldn't make the decision of leaving him but I had to travel and I traveled twice during the pandemic unfortunately and it, it's such a stressful situation that I wouldn't want to wish it on anybody um, and I felt quite guilty about my my wife and my daughter having to leave them I felt guilty about my work and about my colleagues putting letting my patients and my colleagues down and I felt guilty that I'm, I'm the only son I'm unable to look after my parents and they're at a stage now where they, they have to have that care for myself. It cannot be substituted by a hospital uh, residential care or a distant family who lives um, far away. It's, it's quite a stressful situation to be in. Yes, it is. Yeah, it sounds very painful, Dr. Yates. Yeah. It, is, it is absolutely painful, yeah. It is. Um, but I'm sure, you know, whoever is listening today, it will help them to understand the situation much better. And thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you again. Thank you for uh, listening to me. So 
Next, we have Dr. Palani Chawami Chellamuthu, who is a consultant endocrinologist at Royal Cornwall Hospital, Truro. He is going to share his personal experiences with us. Welcome to the program, Dr. Charles. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you for speaking to me. Uh, and uh, I'm going to share my story with you all today. Uh, well, I, uh, can, I, can I continue? Yes, yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, like the other uh, participants before me, uh, I came from South India um, and I've been in the UK since 1997. And this year, during the height of the pandemic, my mum, who was 84 year old, suddenly became uh, very unwell. Um, and my dad, who's 86 years old, um, had to look after her um, during her short illness. Unfortunately, uh, me and my brother, my brother is also a doctor, he's also in, in the UK, we are the only family for my parents, we couldn't go, um, because there were no flights at that time, so... Um, I apologise, I'm feeling very... emotional thinking about it, but she passed away, so my dad had to... Uh, do the funeral himself, um, and then so then I decided. Uh, I must say, uh, I've been here for twenty five years now, so a quarter of a century. So I didn't know anything about India visa, etc. My mum and dad always said they wanted to live in India as long as they could. So I never looked into it. They came visited us like twelve, thirteen years ago, and I visited a visa. Uh, they didn't have any problems, so I didn't. I didn't look into it. I was uh, uh, totally ignorant about this problem. Then me and my wife, uh, we decided, okay, dad has got no other option. He has to come and live with us. And then to our disbelief and horror, when we looked into this and listened to the stories, it, it, I mean, it still feels like it, it's, I'm still in disbelief, utter disbelief, um, such inhumane rule. Um, could be in a country like the UK. Anyway, so. So sorry to hear, Charles. Yeah, yeah. I do apologize. So uh, basically what's happening is uh, I've, I've got, we've got two children. My wife is a GP, she's, um, <clears throat> she's English and um, we live very close to my in-laws. We're all Cornish, um, like uh, walking distance. Um, so I've got two children of um, age uh, 14 and 11, so they can go to my wife's parents any time. And uh, we've been visiting my parents every year, and I've been going every three months for the last few years. So as soon as my mom died, we were all very upset. The next question my children ask is, why can't I and my dad come and stay with us? We can go and see my mom's parents any time. Why can they come here? Why can't he come here? It's um, it's it's. Um, I apologize um, again. So I um, still feels raw talking about it. But anyway, so we applied and it got rejected, and we are going through the appeal. Um, but this is just unbelievable. When I tried to explain this to my colleagues, they keep saying, "Surely." You, you can bring him here, then apply from here. I keep telling them that's not possible. Surely it can't be true. So this was, this rule was, in my opinion, sneaked in without any due consideration at all. And the numbers we are talking about, as before, you know, it's, a, it's hundreds, um, uh, not even thousands, the real ones. Um, and the rules before 2012 was anyone aged 65 and over, if they're financially dependent on a UK resident, they could apply. But now it's, it has to be a close relative. They need care. You have to prove they need care. And you have to prove that care is neither affordable nor available in the country. How can you prove in any country, how can you prove there is no care of some sort? or a care home of some sort is impossible. Um, and you have to, how can you prove you're able to afford, uh, sorry, you're able to look after your mom or dad here, 
But at the same time, you're not able to look after them financially in their own country. So it's like, uh, it's a, it's impossible rule. Um, anyway, it does not make any sense. And having lived in Britain for 25 years, um, I feel I have never come across anything like this in day-to-day -day life. The home office just, uh, it feels like an alien land to me. Um, I suppose I've been here too long um, and haven't dealt with them for a long time, but it's, it's a hostile, really hostile approach to uh, very vulnerable elderly patients. I'm sorry, Kavita, I've been going on too long. No, not at all, not at all, Charles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to say. First of all, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. And uh, um, honestly, I, I think I need some few minutes here. Um, it's, it's, it's so painful and so awful when I, you know, I, I can only imagine what you've been going through, Charles. And again, thank you so much for sharing with us, which is very close to your heart. And I'm sure there will be hundreds or even thousands of, uh, you know, people who are in the same situation. And um, I'm sure, you know, um, they are at least, I don't know what to say here. Um, but again, thank you so much for sharing with us, uh, Charles. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I hope um, these uh, discriminatory visa rules and regulations will be challenged and changed because of efforts of all the people like Usha Ji, Dr. Lakshman, and so many other people. And I I'm just hoping. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kavita. Um, uh, first of all, thanks to everyone who took part in this um, very emotional, touching um, informative show. Thanks to Usha Ji for giving her expert advice, uh, Dr. Lakshman to highlight the issue and, and a very touching personal story from uh, Chels and, and Mo. Before we finish, uh, I'm sure many listeners would be interested how, what can they do? How can they contribute? Is there any number they can contact us? Obviously, they can write to me uh, at uh, bitamilradio at gmail.com. It's B-I-T-A-M-I-L, gmail.com. Uh, can I ask uh, the speakers if, um, if they want their contact details so that if people want it, they can contact, uh, you know, they, they can take part in the BAPIO campaign. Uh, if you are a medic or even otherwise, uh, I understand Mo is writing to the Gar Guardian and other to create the uh, public awareness or maybe contact Usha Ji for her advice. Mm -hmm. uh, before we finish, can I I'll ask, the speakers to, to if they want, they can you know uh, their contact details or how 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 can listeners contact them. Um, uh, th th thank you, thank you, Ariel. I think uh, Bapio. Uh, if they go to the Bapio website, there will be an admin uh, Bapio email. Uh, that probably is the uh, best way to contact us. Uh, so I think. I can't remember it offhand, but it might be admin.bapio, but something. But if you go to the Bapio website, there will be a contact phone and email, and that might be the best way to get in. Uh, as Bapio is coordinating the response, you know, is, 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 uh, so I think that may be the best way. Okay, thank you, Lakshman. There will be a British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. You can Google and go to their website. Uh, anyone else wants to add their contact details? Yes, um, I, I can say, Azil, that... Um... If people want to contact me, it's a good idea, for example, to go on my website, which is Trent Chambers. Uh, but I'm sure if they wrote to Bapio, Bapio would also give them my details. And sincerely ask people if they just want to get initial advice, especially because of the alternative way of getting your parents to stay, um, please do contact me and I will try my levelist. If I can't handle it myself, I'll refer you on. But I think we must, uh, you know, share those bits of knowledge to help each other. Okay, thank you very much, Ushaji. Even though it's been led by BAPIO and the medics, uh, I understand this is open for anyone who can contact us. We, we will try to put you through to the right person. Uh, once again, thank you all listeners uh, for patiently listening to uh, our show. Uh, and I hope we achieved our aim of being informative and, and also uh, um, inspirational stories and um, and thank to all uh, people who took part. Okay, have a enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.